uh, screen you something instead of just describing what I've done with a couple of the projects that were um, taking part into the workshop. So possibly the slides will help to understand what I've done when I was locked in into uh, the elementary school with a couple of guys. Uh, so first of all, first, uh, who I am, I'm, as the slide says, Nicolo Gallio. Uh, what I do is it might be less easy to, to grasp because uh, I am supposed to be here because I have an interest for audiences and for films as well. And I tried to combine these two areas in the past 10 years in many, many different ways. Uh, but I also work across other uh, creative industries. So film is my first uh, passion, let's say, and the, possibly the most important for me. Uh, but I also uh, work across uh, other creative industry and cultural industry. Um, I started, let's say, more or less 10 years ago as a freelancer. Um, when, after graduating cinema, television and multimedia, I started as an intern into a communication agency uh, in Italy. And among the clients that we had, there were a few film festivals that I was always happy to work uh, on, because we had other clients that were more boring, in my opinion, but let's keep that. Um, so back then, we were in charge of PR and media relations. So I was, without knowing, uh, doing something that nowadays called uh, audience engagement, in a way. Because I was using, uh, in that case, uh, media outlets to reach out to audiences. Back then, it was just called media relation and PR, uh, so traditionally it is still nowadays. Um, so after that, uh, I was also working as a freelancer for many other uh, clients, but I also wanted to go back to uni to delve into these new uh, things that were coming back then, which was the digital revolution in a way, so I wanted to understand what was going on, why people were doing what they were doing with films, why they were remixing content that they were not supposed to touch, why they were pirating films, why they were uh, taking part and also supporting films. So there were interesting things going on that I wanted to, to, to try to understand. So I thought that a PhD was a nice way to, to do it. Uh, not economically, I would say, but nice. Uh, so I went back to uni in Bologna and I got my PhD in film studies there and I started to teach at the university as well and I again I started to uh, basically create things to engage audiences without knowing because back then audience engagement was not uh, a term uh, but I was creating web series strategic communication with my students in the film labs back then. Um, later on, I kept on working as a freelancer again, many agencies, I was working as a writer, I was working even as a ghostwriter, so I had quite experience even creating the content uh, for the Italian market mainly, because I'm not a speaker of that language. Um, and then I moved to the UK, and I started again to teach at university, mainly film and media departments, where still I was going uh, into uh, all those kind of niche content that were created by and consumed by audiences and I uh, was again delving into what was going on in the film industry at large. And one of the most important areas that I started to uh, study was crowdsourcing and crowdfunding which a few years ago was not so common in university but now it's quite uh, established as an area as well. So again, I was trying to understand why people are so engaged with content that are still uh, they want to produce content along with the proper creator of the content, they want to contribute, they want to even change it and hacking it, uh, all these kind of things that every time I talk about it, uh, all the directors and scriptwriters kind of freak out because they don't really want that people touch their, their work. But it happens, uh, so you better know. Uh, especially when a film is very popular, uh, people have a nice way of engaging it which very often is quite scary for the creator of the content, but very often the reason why they do what they do is because they love the content very much and they want, in a way, make, make it on their own, uh, basically. Um, so, uh, in, in the process of doing these things, I also uh, got the chance to got selected by the Torino Film Lab Audience Engagement, Audience Design, which is called nowadays Audience Design Program, which gave me a uh, structure, a very practical experience in how to create uh, audience awareness for uh, films that are not films at this stage, they are scripts that hopefully are going to become 
uh, fields. Uh, so how to engage audiences at that stage and how to keep the process going on uh, until you try to make the film happen, until you develop the script, you go into production, post-production, distribution, and so on. So that gave me a wider paradigm to work on again. Um, and I kept on working and collaborating with uh, TFL uh, all along. So what I usually do when I work in contexts like this is uh, I work with one or two projects that are selected by the program that hosts me. Um, so again, I want to thank the Mediterranean Film Institute for inviting me and giving me the chance to uh, do it here. Um, I work with the two projects and we try to understand what can be done in terms of audience engagement, what uh, strategies can be devised uh, at this stage of the, uh, of the process. Um, and then I usually present as I'm doing what we've done so far. So I put together what we've done in, uh, let's say, six hours of workshop uh, two days ago, plus a bit of um, preliminary work, which I'm going to show you in the next. 60 slides, so be prepared to it. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to read what is written because it's, this is the best way that we can screen it, so in case you don't read it in space here, or I can read it for you or whatever, you can pretend that you've read it. Um, so, let's start. Um, there is usually a way of introducing uh, the importance of audience engagement, which can be done through explaining all the theories in media and film studies related to, for example, digital revolution, but I suppose that you are not interested in that. So I will skip it just uh, for the sake of going through a few words that uh, usually are more interesting for people that create the content, uh, which is uh, referring to someone who really makes film rather than film theorists or academics which very often just boring uh, theorists. Uh, so people that try to engage audience at the very early stage uh, they say that they do it because A, it's important to understand what the market can be for the film when the film is not there uh, yet and if you don't know what the market is, if you don't know what the audience is, if you have no idea of the person that you are going to um, create your content for, uh, well it's less easy to market it and it's quite complicated when you are having a conversation with someone that can help you uh, to make the project happen if you have no idea about your potential audience. So it's very nice when someone who possibly can step into the creative team ask you who are you creating this story for, aside for yourself, which is fair enough, always a good idea. Uh, but if you have to make uh, this film happen, possibly you want to have a wider audience. So, process of discovery, as John Reese, the maker and producer, uh, uh, usually say it's something that can start as soon as possible and goes through the whole uh, subsequent phases. No matter how long they last, because nowadays you can really, for example, push a film as long as you want, as long as you have the budget for, as long as you have an interest for, and as long as you have the strength, let's say. So possibly it can never end, uh, at least in theory. Another way of looking at that is if you are a fan of creating, uh, let's say, a wider range of content around your story, which is usually referred to as transmedia storytelling, is that this is more engaging. So storytelling is usually um, a better way to try to understand if a story can reach out to an audience because the audience through the storytelling feels more uh, dragged into what you are considering as experience. This is true for all the creative industry I'm working on at the moment. So it comes from journalism nowadays, it comes from uh, advertising, uh, traditional marketing, whatever. People keep on telling storytelling works better. Especially for uh, industry that really deals with uh, economic business. Uh, if storytelling is not working, they drop it immediately because it's something that they try, if it doesn't work, they skip it for something else. So a lot of the theory that nowadays are also related to storytelling comes from advanced uh, advertising agencies that they try to create experiences uh, around their product which are uh, enriching for their potential audience uh, at the same time. Storyscaping, for example, if you ever heard about it, is one of the latest buzzwords within the industry and it comes from advertising. 
Um, so I'm referring to a lot of things each and every time you want to know more, you're not sure what I'm talking about, uh, you don't agree, just raise your hand, don't wait for the final Q&A, um, just stop me and say that I'm then pushing you back. Anyway, Nuno Bernardo in this case is one of the European leading figures in transmedia storytelling. Uh, one of the objections that I usually get when uh, I talk about transmedia storytelling in the context of European filmmaking is that this is not the way we make stories, uh, which is just partially true. Uh, possibly it's not the most common way, but people in Europe are making transmedia storytelling with high results, with nice projects, and there are many awards everywhere, so we are quite good at that. Um, if you have doubts, I can give you names later on. But uh, one of the things that I usually try to explain to anyone who uh, is interested in, in audiences is that all the terms that we usually refer to uh, to define an audience, which is like consumers, targets, viewers, fans, are all true. Uh, they refer to different level of engagement. But at the very root of everything, uh, they all are people, so we don't have to forget that we are interacting with real people. So the reason why sometimes um, some campaigns are not responding very well is because we uh, skip the fact that we are dealing with uh, people. And people can react in the way that we hope they react or they can surprise us. So sometimes we don't have a backup plan, sometimes we react to uh, bad comment uh, posted online on our film in, in a way that is not necessarily, um, let's say, welcoming. So they react and counter react. So this is a nice way of saying, always bear in mind that they are not robots, even there are a lot of bots online. Uh, people can uh, surprise you uh, for the good or evil in a way. And also, in terms of um, what is audience engagement and where can we place it within all the interaction that we can have with uh, these people, uh, this is a nice diagram that actually comes from the fledging fund creative media dimension of impact. I will if you don't, if you can make it. Um, and I'm not sure if you can really read the words there, but let's say the engagement is more or less in the middle of this concentric diagram. Uh, which means there is a, a, a quite a powerful way of interaction. Uh, it's not the very basic one, uh, which might be just the awareness. Sometimes you hear creating awareness, which might just be linked to putting online the teaser poster of your film without really trying to engage and expecting a reaction. It's just a way of saying this is the film and it's there. You're not really going this next step in a way. Um, and it's in between because the most important reaction that you can get uh, according at least to this diagram is the social change, which is very important, for example, for people that are developing uh, documentaries um, because very often they tap into something that is very felt in society, so they hope that with their project that they are running at the moment they can really delve into the energy of the people that might be interested in that. Um, this is not always true for filmmakers, but for a documentary filmmakers, this is very much important. So engagement you can see in, in between all these kind of layers. And also, engagement is such a wide term that under that umbrella, you are free to add whatever you think to that. It's just uh, this, the top of the iceberg. Um, there are things related to marketing, no matter which kind of marketing you are thinking of. Digital marketing, social media marketing, uh, even this kind of new buzzword which is transmedia marketing, all falls into the first one. Then you have the traditional way of engaging which is PR media relation, which you are going to do through the media outlet as usual. Uh, community building is very interesting, I suppose, for uh, someone who is at this stage because you can really start to build someone around your project that later on can help you to make it happen if you, for example, want at some point to crowdfund part of the budget for, uh, to complete the film. Uh, don't wait for the last minute for that. Uh, community building is a long process. Um, and so, even though nowadays you might have heard about virtual reality, which is really the hottest thing in, in, across many industries, but especially in the audiovisual industry, 
Uh, people are crazy about it. They don't really know how to use it at the moment, but they think that this is going to be uh, as revolutionary as it was like a filmmaking in the beginning. Uh, let's see wait. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing what people are, for example, uh, saying about your film, uh, big data is another big thing nowadays. You have these agencies that can track down all the conversations that are related to your film, and then they can uh, fill a report with all the pro and cons, all the conversations that are going on. They can even tell you where this conversation is taking place. So in case you want to distribute your film, you might be interested in knowing that in that specific city, everyone is talking about it. So you can do things. Uh, these are usually referred to as um, actionable insights. So data that you can really work with. You can make things happening with that. Of course, the uh, downsides of all these nice things is that you can't really do everything for every project. So I usually say that every time you have to tailor-made the strategy on your project because if you have this kind of red guy there, which I suppose you know, which is yeah, so it's the possibly if you ask me from the Hollywood perspective, that is the most powerful uh, audience engagement campaign so far. Um, and of course, if you have that, you can do a lot of things that you can't do if you have a film set in the Amazon, which is an amazing film, by the way. But of course, you can't do all the things that uh, that will allow you to do. So each and every time you always have to be careful uh, the approach that you want to take. Uh, nothing has to be scrapped from, from your diary in the beginning, but uh, you have to tailor-made a bit your ideas. So that is why we spend time together with groups and a team of creative people trying to understand how we can help that happening. So this process uh, that I refer to as engagement process, um, I'm sure you can't read it, but it's more or less based on the fact that if you want to engage with someone, you have, first of all, try to understand where this someone is. So basic uh, communication studies uh, that teaches you that um, you have to understand where this person is, who is talking to this person, who is hanging around with this person, what is the place where uh, these guys are gathering. So no matter where you are looking at, if it's a digital environment, maybe a forum online or a Facebook page, or if it's a real world, physical world, maybe they hang out around the bar after that they've seen the film, it's up to you to understand that, but once you've done that, you have to understand how they, do they behave. Because if you want to engage them, you can't impose a communication strategy into an environment that is usually, it has its own rules, basically. So you don't go into a forum online posting the teaser for your film without asking the admin, for example, unless you want to really have a huge backlash. So try to understand what are the rules uh, when these guys are hanging around. And this is true for everything. Uh, you can flyer for your film in the street, but if you do it smiling, it's better than just dropping it uh, at the corner of the street. So let's also try to understand how this can be done. Very practically, um, we for many of you, for example, uh, are up there, script development stage, I think, for more or less of you, right? You are working in, on the script on the stage. Um, so, uh, at some point, it's not even up to you to set up a strategy to promote the film when it's the time, but you want maybe to have your say. So you want to understand what your partner that is in charge to promote the film whether it's the distributor or the marketing agency that you have hired is going to do. It's respectful of what you, what you envision for your story. Uh, you want to say, no, I don't really want to go that way. If it's possible, I would like to go that way because I think that this is more, much more respectful for my story. Uh, it always depends on partners, but I've, uh, I've heard and I had colleagues that had awful experiences with marketing campaigns that completely ruined the film because they were creating posters that were not going anywhere. But still, um, if you have some ideas, now is the time to start to think about it because at some point you might even want to develop something and you need the material to do it, like let's say stupid things, an interview with an actor on the set that you want to use later on to promote it but then you are not on the set anymore because you have now the ideas and you were on a mountain far, far away two months ago. 
had you uh, had in mind that before, you could have done it. And that is something that happened to me in another workshop when there was a filmmaker that shot something in Afghanistan in a very, very um, uh, dangerous area. And she wanted them to have something to use for the promotional campaign. And we talked about having the production diaries shot there. And she said, it's real shame because I didn't have the idea back then, and now it's basically impossible for me to go to go back. Uh, so this is a stupid example, but still quite interesting. Um, so script developer, you are here, and then you will likely go through the whole thing. So the idea that you might have now might have an impact later on, and so the materials that you would like to have uh, in six months' time maybe are better to be at least uh, thought at this point. So uh, another thing that I usually stress is that um, at some point people will tell you, because it's true, uh, that you are supposed to now take care of the field, which is right. Um, this is the most important phase. You are supposed to make the choices that will have an impact on, uh, on, on the very last draft that is going to become the, the, the future film that you're working on. Um, and this is also something that, quite funnily, is um, happening at the moment. So you are making choices now that will prevent you to do something later on because you are making drastic choice. This is going the moment where you are deciding the amount of iron that you want to put into the script. So this is going to become a dramedy or this is going to become a comedy with slightly um, dramatic events that happen inside of it. Um, so for example, that is going to impact the promotional campaign if you want to exploit the elements that are in the script. Um, are you still with me? <laughs> okay. um, so the, the thing is, um, this is the way I do it. Uh, the way I do what I do. Uh, there are many ways I suppose to do it. Um, I have colleagues that with different backgrounds do what I do in a different way. So if they come more from marketing, they do it uh, with a very strict marketing approach. If they have production background, they have another take on it. So my is a mix of things. I've been exposed to a few workshops on myself. I went to a lot of creative workshops where I've been what I tried, some of the uh, tools that I'm using right now, and I discovered myself something that I think could fit into this kind of template. So don't take this as the Bible, it's just what I do, uh, and it kind of fit to me. Uh, so uh, we are now see uh, what to me is more or less the approach in a set of phases. This is a breakdown of the, of the process that can have more sub-phases if you want. Uh, but let's say this is the clearest way of uh, putting it in words. Um, and the work that I've done with the two projects here uh, are just the beginning of phase one. So we're not going to see the all five phases because at this stage it doesn't really uh, matter. You don't have a budget to do what we are trying to figure out that could be done. Uh, but at the same point, if you really want to have a strategy or the idea that you are trying to devise uh, should become uh, more concrete. So you will have a budget to implement, you will have a team to do it, unless you can make it on your own, which is always nice, but it's a lot of work. Um, and then, after implementing, you have to keep an eye on what's going on. You can't, as they say, see anything, for example, online and forgetting about it. You want to see the reaction of it, and this is true for all the ideas that you, that you have. You don't want to have a marketing campaign which includes media relation activities without knowing what is the output of that, without seeing the interviews on paper, without seeing uh, you taking part into a forum or whatever. So at some point, all this is going to become much more complex. But for the sake of uh, this workshop, uh, we try to do this on two projects which are very different. So I'm going to go through the whole thing with the first one and then I'll repeat it for the second one. Uh, so in the first one, I will also try to explain a bit more what the tools are about and how you can you can use that. Uh, uh, so other teams that I work with here at the moment, Peter and the Wolf, yes, they disappeared this year. Okay, yes, you are. Of course. 
So uh, thank you guys for allowing me to use your own words because uh, I think it's interesting to share the process without me trying to uh, retell the words that the guys used. Um, so I'll start with this um, and then we go on with the second one. As I said, phase one is about trying to define what are the, the usually the the word asset is very much marketing oriented, so it's not very nice, but it's pretty much clear, so we all get what it, what it means. So try to understand what are the strengths of the of the project, what are really the resources that, that are in place that are unique from that story. And it's something that I usually do by going through all the materials that you provided to the MFI in this case. So I read uh, all the synopsis, all the um, letter of intent, director's note, the script, if it's already there, whatever. Uh, it takes a lot of time if you have to do it for all the project, but it's very interesting because as yesterday someone said, at some point, maybe Martina said it, um, you, you have a feeling of what's going on in a very specific moment because the stories are uh, circling around something. So it's very true, when you read uh, 30 stories from the same like uh, same year, and in a way they're telling you something about society, so this is very interesting. And that's why very often all these films have political elements into it, even if you are not putting them into your script consciously, they are there anyway, so people will get it, um, even if you try to sneak out. Um, so the asset to me is all this plus all the visual that you have developed, if you have developed something. Uh, and even better, if you have teasers or short uh, clips that you have uh, shot, that's great. Uh, and this is also relates to what Martina was saying yesterday. It's better to have something original rather than putting together ideas that have been developed for other films. Like sometimes I see trailer or teaser that are using uh, footage from The Matrix, which is amazing, but it's The Matrix. Or sometimes it's about uh, putting together footage in black and white, but when you talk with the director, they say, well, we are not shooting black and white, so why did you put the black and white? Because it gives you a precise idea of a thing that is not going to happen. So the more precise you are, and the more precise you are in the way you want to produce the content, the better it is, because it's going to stay sticking to the mind of everyone who is going to be exposed to that. So it's better rather not having anything better to describe it, rather than giving someone a different idea of your project. So in this case, I also use a set of, um, of um, tools that have been there forever, like you ask the creative team to complete sentences to see in their own words what uh, the film is about. And this is interesting when uh, you ask to different members of the team uh, to complete the task, because very often the director is going to produce a sentence that is completely different from the producer. And that is amazing because it's not uh, that they're going to different direction, it's that we are human beings, of course, and we have different roles within the project. So it's just a matter of saying how we can adjust those apparently different paths. Uh, so in this case, it's like, uh, can you read that or should I, should I do it for you? It's clear? Okay, so I'm not going to read uh, um sentences, but it's nice how we develop this dialogue because for him it's a very personal story, as for I am sure 99% of you. Um, and then we have to understand how this personal story can talk to a wider audience. So how. Which element can we take out from that that can have a value from someone else that didn't have your personal experience? So that is why going through the teams, uh, dissecting the script for me is very important. So when you ask to someone what is important, very often, as I said, you get very, very personal uh, answers, like it's something that uh, reflects part of my personal story, my struggles, and I want to be uh, clear with my audience that I am exposing myself into this, but at some, point, at some point I want to have an answer for them, I want to see if this uh, story echoes to someone else. Uh, so it's like at this stage a kind of, of psychological process where I ask the team to expose a bit because I have to understand how I can use that uh, on a deeper level and I can maybe uh, take those feelings into an upper layer where they can talk to someone else. 
uh, this is a part that I really like, um, by the way. And the same goes for the goals. Uh, each of us has different, of course, goals when you are developing a project as complex as a film. Um, in this case, it's very interesting because here we have, of course, the, the need to create a good, good, good film, the best film possible, in order to step into an industry uh, on an international level. So through the chat that we had with Francis, for example, we established that uh, here in Greece, he's quite known because of his previous work, now he wants to step into the more international level. So the need to go into a festival is not just, uh, uh, let's say, he, he used the word cynical, which I really like it, but at the same point he's very honest. Uh, I mean, going to a festival for many of you is going to open many, many doors. So it's not just that you want that award on your desk when you're going to, to write your next film. Very often you really need that to step into it. Um, but more than that, having this uh, very peculiar artistic vision that he has developed through all the, all the material that I'm going to show you in a bit, um, he is there as immediately uh, visible from, for, for everyone. So uh, the things that are coming at that stage are very, very interesting because that can also help you to, to shape um, a campaign maybe later on that can really uh, feed all these needs at the same time. Uh, for many directors, for example, they are kind of shy in the way they talk about their future career. And that is very interesting because you don't really want to expose someone that is not very comfortable in, in, in being on the spotlight. So it depends really each and every time on the, on the uh, on the person. And I remember when I was doing uh, PR and media relations, we had amazing films and we kind of figured out how many journalists were interested in the topics, but the, at the same point the director didn't really want to speak about it because he was not uh, comfortable in, in doing any sort of media relations activity. So we had to skip that option and try to self, let me use that, uh, in, in a different way. So people will react anyway, but the, the way you are going to expose the theme, for example, is very, uh, is very delicate. So themes can be uh, split into, into many ways. So this is just the beginning of it. You can have a much more complex breakthrough. But this is just to show you how you can use what is within the script and try to put it on a different level, let's say, so it's at the same time individual and universal. It depends on the themes that are in the script that we want to leverage. So at some point is about really trying to see how many things you can get and how you can use them for, in this case, um, uh, promotional, uh, promotional use. Um, do you read that, more or less? It's like I use maybe to clear code. But anyway, so it's, um, I suppose you know a bit of the project of Peter and Wolf, right? More or less. It's such a fairy tale world. So all this is pretty much the background of the story, which is like in the script, as immediately is there. Uh, but at the same time, you have, let's say, a social and political. Uh, uh, layer which is there and then it depends on how much you want to push that uh, for you as a creator while you're developing the script and later on how much you want to use those elements in order to create something around it. So at this stage they are still trying to understand how much they want to go political as per the second project as well. Uh, but in this specific case um, the team has also this need uh, that the visual representation of this world is so powerful the risk is that the card is going to disappear a bit. So the, the chat that I had with Anzi was pretty much clear in saying that he doesn't want that this word uh, kill, uh, kills this character. He wants that the story comes through the character, but at the same time he's aware of the fact that um, this visual storytelling is very much powerful. So here you have to find a balance in between that. At some point you have to decide through the script how much space you want to uh, this word to have. Um, so, and my question also for all of you: Have you ever googled yourself? Mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> how, how was that? <laughs> it's good. It's good. Right? <laughs> I like it. Well, this is uh, not all of 
not everyone does it, but it's a very cathartic experience because you find things that you you didn't think about it. Um, so if you if you do it, you understand a bit where you are at this point of your career um, on a professional level and on a personal level. So I did it, and in five minutes, more or less, that is what you can get, which is totally incomprehensible for you. I, I got it. Uh, but let me tell you, it's a mix of personal, uh, social media uh, platforms, profiles, uh, websites, um, Facebook profiles, uh, personal, but also for the things that he already uh, shot. Uh, we have quite interesting uh, social networks here because Instagram is going to become even more and more important, especially for visual storyteller. Now it's something that you can really leverage a bit. Uh, and of course the traditional channel on uh, YouTube and Vimeo as always for uh, filmmakers and directors. Um, Excuse me, can I, yeah. can I just ask you to speak a bit slower? Sure. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, this is kind of a portrait. It tells you just online where you are. Of course in the real world you have much more results if you want to go out and ask uh, do you know me or not. But let's say your presence is already telling you something. This is not just an exercise because you can leverage all this to promote what you're doing basically. So you are going to get as that closer to engage someone just by being there. Because you're already where people hang out, as we were saying before. Uh, this is all platforms that people use. And for creative purposes, this is amazing. So the downside of it is that um, you might not want to uh, do it, which is perfectly fine. Again, um, it's up to you as a creative person to expose your creative process, expose yourself in a way that you prefer. So, um, and those social media, for example, nowadays are a key resource for everyone, especially for someone who wants to leverage them for work. Uh, you don't have to be there if you don't want. So, especially for filmmakers, for example, um, or a scriptwriter, which is very interesting kind of a person that very often doesn't want to interact a lot, uh, let's say. They love to do what they do, but you know, if they can lock themselves into a room, that is perfect. And I am myself like that, so I know what I'm saying. Um, so, for example, you don't want to force someone like that to be on Twitter and tweet about whatever. Uh, so the, the suggestion that, for example, we usually say is that you want to find a place where you are comfortable and to find your own way of using that. And same goes with the tools. Um, some social media are more um, likely to be used for a very specific kind of person, some one are more engaging, so you have to keep an eye on what's going on. And if it's time consuming, it's a lot of work, but sometimes um, it's worth uh, doing it. So, if you don't want to be there, don't be there. It's better not be there than be there with a, like, a, okay, I have to do it, what I'm going to tweet today, uh, it's like an hell. People are going to be there and read what you say and just keep it forever. So, just don't do it. And the same goes with the uh, production company. You can do this analysis on each and every creative person that is involved into it. So, at some point, you will have a map of possible entry points or possible tools that we can use later on to uh, really engage someone. Uh, and it's not just about the, the profile, which can be just that if you don't post anything. It's about where you are in terms of networking. Networking is key. Everyone says that in every industry, but it's true. Uh, very often you can step into an industry by just knowing physically someone instead of sending your proposal to 100 people that likely is going to, they're going to receive 1,000 per, per week. So, um, for example, it's important to understand who supported your work before, who talked about you before. Um, this is a mix of networking opportunities that, uh, in this case, Dan has already went through, and it's also a mix of people that were talking about his uh, work before. So, in that case, all this can be used again when he's ready to spread the word about his, uh, his job. So whatever you're going to do uh, to promote yourself, it's like you're building something that you can use later on. You have to have this kind of attitude that say, okay, it's not 
going to die after this film. I can use what I'm building now for my next project. So it's priceless. Later on you will have uh, some sort of critical mass that is going to be nice to have on board when you need it. Um, okay, so visual materials, uh, in this case, are kind of overwhelming because it's a very, very visual story. And it's about trying to understand the look and feel and what inspired the story even before producing your content. So here is a mix of uh, some of my favorite, actually, um, directors like um, Tim Burton, Darren Aronofsky, uh, and so on. So this is already coming from uh, known sources. But this is going to become more personal because in this corner here you're already seeing that there is a shift into, into the style that is going to uh, become what is really interesting to me. So the real core original material of, of the story, so in this case a promo poster, but even more importantly uh, the original concept art. So the, the heart of the film for this project is already here and you can feel it and you can really see how uh, personal is this language. So it's a mix of a real model in this case and a sketch that an artist did it for, for, for the film. Um, and this already brings something on the table which is related to uh, the mood, what kind of film can this be? Because uh, you look at the nationality and you say, okay, this can be a fairy tale set in Greece, but if you look at the mood board and the concept art, it doesn't really feel like that. Because if you have a, a, a walk out there, it's not really like that. So, and, and it's interesting because now it's an artistic choice how uh, you can shape a fairy tale like that coming from Greece, but still speaking another language, which is very interesting because you could have done it by setting it on on on, on that. Uh, and, it, and it's a very interesting case because it's not the usual way of uh, Italian doing uh, fairy tales. We don't usually do fairy tales a lot, to be honest. Um, and that specific choice of having a language like English on board, but with not a Polish English, with not the same language, it was like weird to me as it was for fantasy as well. Uh, which brings us to a key element for this film as well. This film, can, it, can this film be shot in English? Can this film be shot in Greek? What is the choice here? because this is going to impact a lot the project. It can be more open to co-production, maybe if it's in English, I don't know, maybe you can ask Martina later on. Uh, so again, it's a script stage, but you have to make that choice, and that choice is going to have a huge impact on what is going to happen. And also, the need here is to find its own way within what is usually labeled as a fantasy genre, without going to the Hollywood kind of storytelling, which is another way of doing it. At some point, it's going to be interesting uh, because later on we see why we want to step away from Hollywood. So, second uh, step is like try to understand uh, what the strength of the projects uh, are and how we can leverage that. And we can use the infamous what analysis, which some of you might have already had the chance to do it. Have you? Yeah. yeah? Did you like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's open to interpretation. Like, it's uh, sometimes it's very powerful. If you are very honest, uh, it's going to bring a lot of issues on the table. And it's like to look at that. Like, hmm, uh, I didn't know that that was kind of a threat to me. So it's again um, a nice way of putting things on that plane, which to me is very, very also interesting because you can swap things from one area to the other, and you can try to leverage uh, what are the strength to. Uh, to, to change and challenge a bit what are the, the things that are not working according to you. So I'm not expecting you to understand anything of that, but just a way of saying that we work a lot on this kind of thing. Um, so but mainly the, the uh, four things that I wanted to point you out of this is that we have possibly a weakness in the Greek language if you want to go for that. And at the same time, if you want to swap into the English, that can be an opportunity. So we already see that there is a contrast that can be solved here. We want to avoid, which is a threat, to, to create a, some sort of hybrid blockbuster that mimics Hollywood but with a different style. We don't want to go there. 
but at the same time, the strength is that we have a strong vision from the director and someone who really can create work with his own hands. So it's very powerful, it's very unique. Um, this is a very interesting project to me. Um, but he has a vibe. So business model canvas, anyone? Raise your hand. Business model canvas. Have you ever used that kind of template? No? Okay, so uh, this can be used as per the SWOT analysis to everything, every kind of um, activity that you want to set up, every kind of industry you want to work in, you can use it. Uh, it's been developed quite some time ago. Uh, for my personal workshop, I use just some areas uh, of that. I'm not interested in going to uh, budgeting revenue stream at this point. But I usually use the value proposition, which is what your film are supposed to bring to the audience, what is unique about it, customer segments, so what are the possible audiences interested in that, and also channels and customer relationship with basically how can I get to that damn audience. So if you want to populate a bit, you can get something like that. So a lot of things are going on there, uh, just saying that, for example, there is a film that, according to this scheme, wants to make people think about issues within the story world that has been created, but at the same time wants to make people uh, have a good time. It's a film that wants to engage quite a nice set of customer segments there, because it can speak to a lot of different set of audiences, um, which I'm not really going through all of that, but basically people that love fairy tales, people that love allegories, people that love fantasy, people, even some niches like gay communities, because there is a, some sort of gay theme within that that still has to be decided if it's still there or not. But even people that like role-playing games, people that love the nice way of creating special effects from the 1980s and 1990s, like the old way of using animatronics, for example, which is the way that we want to go, that fans want to go, avoiding the CGI thing that doesn't really look like uh, the real thing. Um, and it's interesting because if you look at the channel, he's very aware of the fact that it can be online. So sometimes I have this conversation with director that they are not interested in the online release. But for a film like that, maybe this is another way of getting, uh, of getting it out. Um, so then, stepping into what is this like idea of audience, um, there is an exercise that you can do to try to understand how you can step close uh, to that ideal audience, which is the persona. Persona, have you ever created a persona before? For games. For games, yes. So the thing is, this exercise basically asks you to create a portrait of your ideal audience, uh, and it works at any level in many, many different industries. Game industry um, use it a lot, um, but it works a lot for the film industry as well. So you give this person an age, sex, um, a background. You can play a lot with the family, what he or she likes to do, hang out with, and so far. But what is interesting to me is that you have to have a layer of uh, interaction with uh, media. I want to know the media diet of this person. So I slightly use a different kind of persona, and I ask you to provide for example, uh, does this person go to the film theater? Does this person watch the film online? Does this person use video games, uh, watches TV, whatever? I want to have an idea of the media diet because that can be an entry point for a lot of things. Does it use social media and stuff like that? Uh, so, when you ask someone uh, working in the industry, film industry, uh, give me an idea about what your film could appeal to. It's usually the old uh, response in the demographic, uh, which is very interesting for many, many reasons. Uh, but I usually say it gives you just a tiny bit of the information that you need. So if you, if you tell me that your film is for everyone from 16 to 25, it's great, uh, possibly quite some billion of people that I hope you're gonna reach, but maybe it's not that specific. So demographics are also useful if you want to, for example, target someone uh, 
I use target now. Uh, if you want to address someone on social media, you can run a digital campaign by using the date, age, demographic, and geographical area. So still does a lot. But let's try to open it. Let's try to, to, to add some layers to that, which is still more interesting to me. So the persona that you can create goes into the direction, which is, um, again, you don't really get anything out of that, but it's a way of uh, even portraying by drawing what this person does during the week, uh, how many devices this person uses, how many social media, and which one. So you can be super specific as much as you want. And of course, you can have many of that, uh, as many as you want. Uh, you can play a lot with this, uh, with this idea. Uh, I'm sure I'm running a lot, but if you want to go after this uh, bad digital persona, you just have to Google it. You add, in this case, Neil Wardrop, and you step into a nice slide presentation that is available for everyone. So you can study really well what he uh, designed for Channel 4 in the UK. So this is the outcome of this kind of exercise, uh, and it also says something about um, this ideal person. So it's quite uh, an interesting person who is, in, first of all, uh, a, f a male, uh, age 27. He's basically on all social media sites. He uh, likes a lot to hang out on social media, and especially like here, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. He uses Apple devices. Uh, he goes to cinema, but he also likes to have a good chat after it with his own friends. Um, okay, so I don't really want to go too much into the detail, but let's say this is an exercise that every one of you can do, and if you're good at drawing, you can really have fun with that. Um, now, for example, you want to also know how you can bring some of the things that we discussed before out of the film. Uh, what can your film do for your potential audience? What uh, can you leverage in a way? So one way of doing it is like creating a map of value that you can apply to this persona as well. So it's another way of uh, looking at the same kind of portrait by using um, feelings and emotions and sentiments in a way. So it gets much more deeper because you can use emotion to trigger something to the viewer. Um, this has been created by this guy called uh, Scott Matthews, but you can find different ways of uh, doing it. Uh, there is a nice book which is called Game Storming. If you want to explore all this exercise, uh, Game Storming by Gray um, and other authors. But anyway, you can ask me later if you want. So the, the, the aim of this is to develop, again, a user profile, but with added uh, emotion. So this film, according to the director, um, is going to have an impact on this person because um, he's someone who hates Hollywood movies, so he wants more personal stories. So he wants uh, to, to interact with something that has a soul, that is sometimes the, the thing that you hear about uh, the, the huge gap in between the Hollywood machine and the European way of creating content. Uh, but he's also an open minded uh, guy who doesn't uh, really matter. Uh, to, to express himself, to show his own emotions. So you really have here maybe a kind of maybe subtle gaze of text again, which is interesting because it comes out uh, of many exercises that we got so far. So an LGBT community is like a, a real interesting audience, by the way, if you want to go for that. Um, another exercise that is interesting and it really steps into the uh, set of things that you can do on your own, for example, is what uh, can you do in order for your audience not to be aware of your project? So it's like a way of looking at the audience engagement uh, process uh, by looking at the anti-problem. So what you want to do in order for no one to know about your film. So. The answer is, for example, not to have a, a website, don't uh, have any social media profile, uh, maybe going to the opposite direction, so create a huge hybrid blockbuster that we don't really want to see. Uh, using all the key art to promote it, so having a blockbuster or whatever. 
uh, and most importantly for uh, this project, don't go into any uh, festival. So in this way, possibly no one will ever know about your film. Which is, uh, again, a nice way to, to, to step into the very basic, what are the very basic things that I myself can do in order to, 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 to engage with someone. Uh, but also tells you something on line two that you don't read, uh, which is about giving a direction to the script on the stage. So creating an allegory that no one is going to get, and possibly even having a finale, an ending that is not going to resolve anything. So, uh, uh, the recipe for disaster is served here. Um, yeah? There's one question. Well, what if sometimes when you're crushes, you know, to build up your engagement with the audience, yeah. you count and you realize that your audience has become such a small amount in, in the human beings? Maybe that is your audience. I mean, uh, I mean you, you tell that there is. Anytime there is an audience. Yes, usually yes. I mean, I never found a, a, a project that didn't go into anyone. I mean, it's really something. Maybe you have a very, very small amount of people going into the film theater when your film is out, which is already something. Uh, maybe you're, it's not a number that you were expecting. Maybe you set up a Facebook page and you have seven followers. Fine. You just have to understand why this is happening. So maybe your film is not the film that uh, you were targeting that audience for. Maybe you are doing something wrong with the campaign that you are running, which is very, very likely the case. Uh, so it's hard to believe that uh, there are projects that don't get anything. And I never heard about it. I just heard about bad reviews, very few people attending screenings. Uh, so that is very likely the case. But then the most important thing is start to understand why this is going to happen. So in the beginning, you might have expectation. And that is the tricky part when you try to figure out responding with the demographic. The demographic don't really tell you uh, a number. It tells you a lot of people, which is like very likely unreachable for many, many of the projects. Because to reach someone, you're going to spend time, very often money, uh, energies, you have to take away people working on other projects to put them on running your social media campaign and whatever. But to my knowledge, I've never heard that someone published a book and no one really read it. At least the mom and dad of this poor guy should have. So, like, but I can't tell you a number because it's really possible. Yeah. Um, okay, so. If you want then to use what I really like to use, which is storytelling, you can take elements and uh, here is the moment when people say this is not the way that we usually do it, but still it's an option for many of the stories that I've read, there are huge opportunities in order to create something through storytelling, which is more engaging, which is more fun for everyone, so if you take elements of, of the script, that are not going to be developed a lot within the main story, you can still have the opportunities, even for a very, very uh, low budget, to create something that is uh, useful for uh, engagement purposes. Like in this case, we have characters within the story that are very, very funny, and there is uh, some sort of uh, retelling of fairy tales through another medium already within the script that is perfect to be taken outside of it and expanded in many, many ways. And we agree that, for example, with a very cheap web series, you can do it. You can have those small, nice, funny characters telling fairy tales on YouTube, which is the perfect channel for it. But again, because it's so visual, the project can also be expanded through uh, graphic novel or books. Um, if you have key partners that can help you, it's just a matter of using the same intellectual property, expanding what you really want it to be in the script, but it was too much. And maybe you already had developed part of that, so you can just have to reshape it, give another packaging in a way, but you need, of course, uh, someone who helps you. Um, so, along the many, many ways of doing, for example, uh, social media engagement, we also agreed that, for example, because this is a very handmade project, you can teach someone to recreate or to create something with their hands. 
It worked, for example, for a film like uh, Frank with Michael Fassbender, where people create tutorials to make the mask, which is the iconic mask that you always wear. So because of the nature of this, uh, of this project, you can do it, but of course it doesn't make sense for other films. So I hope this was, of course, rushing, but I wanted to give you an idea of the potential of, of this story. Still with me? Yeah, cool. Okay, now, the second project is uh, a very different one. Uh, again, another one that I enjoyed, and is the Disappeared, which I believe you know more or less the story. It has this powerful metaphor of um, males uh, disappearing into a very patriarchal society, and this, again, powerful resurgence of the, the female presence within that. Which is in itself is a great metaphor to address a very, very political theme. So again, uh, within the script, it's a matter of at this stage to understand how much you want to push the political element and how much you want to keep it on the background and develop the story using uh, this uh, approach that Lamin wants to, to, to use, which is very peculiar in the way of shooting it. Uh, partially black, it's black and white, it's partially mute in the beginning for one character. Um, there is this nice overtone of irony, which still has to do with what happens uh, in the story. And doing again the same exercise, which you know, can master right now, uh, it's again, uh, let's see where uh, Ramin and the company, production company are. Uh, so again, entry point to the story. I'm going to go quickly because now you, are, you know how it works. Um, it's a mix of different websites. Uh, quite interesting because uh, he studied in the US. He has a profile on stage 32, which is much more US oriented as a platform. Although you can use it more or less everywhere. So I have a profile there as well, which I never use. Um, but again, uh, official website for the company, Facebook and Twitter profile, Instagram, again, use Instagram guys, it's amazing at the moment. Um, networking was talking about, uh, the company was talking about um, uh, the director already, same discourse for uh, the previous project, you can leverage that in order to, when it's time, uh, build some interest into, into the project. I would say when, when and if you do it, um, try to make, um, make it happen gradually, don't overload people just by saying, hey, I'm at this workshop, uh, next week I'm at another workshop, and next week again I've read uh, this book which is amazing and inspiration. So shape the communication stream uh, for, for each and every media outlet. And I know it because very often, because I kind of have a blog, and I blog about film and media, I got overwhelmed by people that once they send me the press release for the film, I write a blog post, and then they assume that for each and every news that they have, I'm going to write again about them, so I receive 25 news, uh, and it's like spam. You don't want to spam. If you spam, it's going to backlash always. Um, so here again we have also nice uh, networking opportunities, programming that he's been through. So usual things that you are doing right now is going to be very very important for your next stage uh, of career. So let's see what this disappeared is. Um, which I mean, if if you read the basic definition that I got, do you think that it's much more? Uh, Ironic or serious as a project? I mean, what is the tone if you just read the definition? Sorry? Who said something? I think it depends on the gender who okay. is reading. Like, if a woman is reading, I think this is funny. <laughs> if a man reads it, I think it can be a thriller. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So this project is about gender roles, and apparently also the reception of it at the very basic level is like quite interesting and, and maybe tricky. So it, it has something that in the next slides is going to come up very often. So of course it's a project that addresses a, a, a very specific global situation. It's set in Turkey, it's set in a very specific country, so we could argue Okay, uh, I'm coming from Italy, I don't know anything about that, more or less, I can imagine what's going to happen. 
But uh, within the script there are uh, scenes of um, male uh, characters beating women that for me coming from well, I'm coming from London, but let's say I grew up in Italy, so we have this huge problem with violence against women, uh, which we even coined a term for it, which is feminicidio, right? Uh, so it's very local, but at the same time, as you see, it's kind of already connected to, to, to a completely different culture. And this abusive system within patriarchal society is what is at the core of this project, and it's uh, uh, I, I tell you, it's written in a way that is funny, but it's very much into your face. So there is a political element that is very, very powerful um, that can be really addressed or, again, according to how the script is going to end up uh, being, uh, kept, kept on, the, on, the, on the background. But it's also something that brings another dimension that is very powerful and not very addressed in, I, I think, in today's cinema in general. So it's women's emancipation within that society. So the, the real strong element within the, within the script is that you can, at some point, uh, get rid of this male dominance, but what it triggers is this uh, renaissance, in a way, this spring of, of uh, women's power in a way, which is very, very interesting as an element to, to use. So the goal is of course pretty much straight away to raise awareness on this condition, uh, which is in my opinion a very, very political goal. So um, question of patriarchy is like um, a thing that you, if you have brave enough you can bring you can bring this on, on, on the screen and you're going to get a very powerful film. So the thing is, now you have to understand where you want to go. Do you really want to go the hard way, so addressing this straight away? Do you want to use this metaphor in order to, for people to make them aware that it's there, but still you want to, to, to bring this like uh, satirical element, impose that in, into this uh, belly of the beast in a way. So where are the themes here? Themes are, uh, of course, uh, at the same level of the structure, the polarization between male and female, the patriarchal society and gender inequalities, pretty much straightforward, they are on the script. But also they trigger something more individual. So the script is pretty much clear in uh, making us understand that each and every character has a different uh, reaction to it. So there, are, there is a, a universe of people in this city, male guys, that are dealing with the situation in a very, very different way. Uh, and this is going to end up possibly in a very creative idea that you can develop other than the film. So in the film it's a constellation of individual reaction by these uh, sketch characters very often. It's a mix of paranoia, it's a mix of witch hunt that people start to understand where are these guys uh, going at the moment. But also it triggers something more universal. So at a more general level you even find that religion is useless even in a country like that. Which is, if you ask me, even more powerful than putting the gender inequality element, especially coming from that country. So these elements are very, very, very interesting, but also harsh to, to tackle in a way. Inspiration, uh, a set of uh, well-known directors, uh, like from Bunuel to Werkmeister, you name it. But what is interesting is that all this kind of work in a previous uh, iconic director ended up in having a very specific need for this film. Uh, so the, the thing is, here you are already making a choice, for example, uh, for the promotion of the film. You're already saying, I would like that the tone of the script uh, will end up in having a coordination within the key art that I'm going to develop. So the choice that they made uh, here, it's pretty much clear. You have an artsy way of presenting, of presenting the film, which could have led to a completely different direction, but they want to go there. Um, and at the same time, they want to convey this kind of binary system of emotion that are there. Uh, the mystery there is, uh, because the, the genre of this film is kind of still to be completely decided, so they can really go into two opposite directions, and it depends on how the script is going to, to be developed. But at the same time, they made already a nice choice, if you ask me, because this is a key uh, promo poster that 
can you can you is there a volunteer here that could read it? What do you see? How would you read a poster like that? What do you think it represents? kind of um, like a flat lining, like a moving towards disappearance in our mind, but you also bring <laughs> different. <laughs> so here we, yeah. Silence. Silence. Another, what? There is a, a line becoming a, a to end that and, 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 the, and, the sh and you can shift it, you know, mm -hmm. it back. So main and more. Okay, so do you, do you like the person? No. <laughs> Why not? Well, because you need too much, you know, to... Okay, it, it, it doesn't it, get when you, when you show us at the beginning, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about this. What I'm going to tell you now is because you have been talking quite a lot about the project. Okay, this is an interesting, um, of course, choice that you can make. Do you want to have this kind of poster that might get you in a while, and of course maybe make sense after uh, watching the film? Because the first time that I, I first read the script, of course, and then I watched the poster and I said, okay, this is to me quite interesting because it's like the flat line of society when the rules are strict, when you don't really have freedom to express yourself and stuff like that. And when these events happen, it triggers a different vibration in society that ends up in being more vital in a way. So it was like maybe too much thought into it, but it made sense in a way, and for some of you it made sense as well going to another interpretation, but still you got, you got what, uh, what they tried to convey. And also the sound element that you, that you said, silence versus uh, noise possibly, it relates to the script as well, because in the beginning of the film, the character film Academy, doesn't even speak, and there is an artistic choice. So I would say this is quite in line with what, where you want to go and it respects many of the elements of the film, and then you have to decide everyone is going to get it or not. But that doesn't mean that you can't use the, the many posters, maybe. It's a choice that many, many uh, films can, 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 can do. So for this film there was also a mood teaser that I'm not going to scream, but it was coming from materials on, on YouTube, so it more or less shows how uh, cocky behavior within male uh, uh, people all over the world are already put it online and here there was a beating of a man against uh, a woman in the street. So it's already talking to another, let's say, environment which is social media, which is a platform where you can find very, very awful things. Uh, but it means that there is something outside of this film, outside of the traditional circuit that can make a film uh, that is already there in society. People are talking about it, people are creating content on it, are sharing it. So, for sure, it's interesting to consider. Um, okay, the analysis here, um, just briefly a few things and then I'm done. Um, opportunities. If you want to go for the political side of it, you can partner up with NGOs. That was on the plate since the beginning, at least according to the, to the creative team. So, you can for sure. Uh, find someone who is already campaigning against violence on women that can help you. Um, if you consider the threats, that is the director choice to use or not this black and white uh, film kind of style, uh, but also the sound design in a very specific way. So, creative choices. Uh, strengths uh, film uh, consider the disappearance left unexplained in the film can trigger forum discussion. So that is highlights to me immediately some sort of social media activity. If you want to go there, you already have a nice element to play with. So the thing is, in, in, at some point in the scene that uh, you can see there are all these um, faces of the guys that have been disappeared, that have been printed on and put on, on a wall, that is a very powerful metaphor and it's already in the film that I suppose can, it can be used in some ways even to create key art of any other level of creativity. So I'm not going to put every element on the business model canvas, uh, just pointing out a few things. 
So this customer segmentation, for example, um, according to Ramin, could speak to someone who is reading in his country uh, comic and satirical weekly publication, which to me already triggers the political element to it. And uh, people affected by uh, protest movement, again, political. So you see that at some point, even if you refuse to go that way, by going through this exercise, you know, nice, kind of therapy, and if it comes over and over again, you really have to address it, because that it means that it's important for you, but you might uh, force yourself not going there. So, is it the right choice? You have to decide. Uh, first idea, so audiences, again, starts from the traditional demographics, uh, and it's interesting because this is much more uh, urban context versus not so urbanized. Uh, so it's a mix of primary audience, uh, mainly female, and a mix of male and female in provincial, uh, in provincial uh, location. So without going too much into the detail, for example, this portrait instead of the other one is a female character, uh, 30 years old, very well educated. Uh, she enjoys both literature, film and music. Uh, both in cinema, theatre and online, um, and she's critical of the political status quo. So again, political element comes out from your ideal audience, so you really want to have someone who can relate on that dimension. Um, and quite interesting, again, uh, she goes to see award-winning films, which to me means that for all of you, again, the festival circuit is a very, very important um, outcome, at least in the beginning. So empathy map here, uh, this person knows what she wants. Uh, ideally, she dreams of freedom, she dreams of democracy. So I suppose this is something that everyone in very specific situation, political and social situation, can relate to this. So I'm not going to uh, give you much more detail, but still, she wants to enjoy and laugh about it. So she's not just concerned about it. She can really okay, go out for a while, see this movie, it triggers to me that message, but still I can have fun watching it. So it goes into the direction of having some sort of comedic element that can be highlighted. And the other problem here, again, is like deciding to go or not for the black and white. So if you don't want to have any sort of uh, People interested in that, just go for the black and white, you go for a science fiction film, and you also create a gender drama that speaks to um, feminist audiences. This is a universe, I mean, we could talk just two hours for the first line, but let's say this is more or less what not to do. Uh, again, because we talked about how we can expand this, um, it, it triggers a lot of things, this story, as well as the previous one. And without suggesting anything, on the table there were already web series in order to expand the amount of characters that don't have such space within the script. And it's a, a really an amazing universe of people there. It's so rich as, as, a, as a script. Uh, graphic novel, it's something that everyone brings on the table if uh, think about the political, uh, satirical novel that has been created in the past few years, maybe it also makes sense, but then you have to find someone for that. Uh, in this case, you don't have such a visual, powerful, uh, creative force on board, maybe you have to partner up with someone that can help you if you really want to, uh, to do it. And so to me, that was just a personal suggestion, the key art with such a powerful element of the visual of all these guys disappeared on the wall, I would suggest to do something with it. Uh, if it was a Hollywood blockbuster, you would have already had a viral website for faking missing people. I already see it, but this is not, for example, the way that they want to go. So it's always nice to know where you want to go, but also even important to know where not to go. And on that note, I think I am done. Uh, so, yeah, just to conclude, don't, uh, don't do anything that you want, don't want to do. Uh, that is the basic uh, suggestion that everyone can give you because sometimes you might find that there are partners that are pushing you into a very precise direction and you have to negotiate a bit. It's all about negotiation. Very often this job is all about it. Define the genre is crucial because from the genre, from the tone, from the vibe that you get from the script, Everything else is going to, 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 to follow, in a way. 
and be honest if there are problems on it, all these small exercises can highlight that. If something is recurring, possibly it's something that you have to take care of. And whatever people suggest you to, to do, don't do it if you don't feel that it makes the good of your script. So respect the integrity, don't set up a Deadpool campaign if you don't have Deadpool. That is. Thank you. Thank you. The only way to do it for two projects in this kind of one hour and a half. So if you have questions, we can maybe chat outside if you don't have time here, so I'm very welcome to.